You guys ready for this? <clears throat> Let's do this. Fruit of the Spirit, part five. My title for today, we'll see if you catch this, hopefully you can. I can't get no. You guys know, you guys are a bunch of heathens. Just kidding. I can't get no satisfaction. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're in the Fruit of the Spirit series, and you're like, okay, wait a minute. I may not be a Bible scholar, but I'm pretty sure that satisfaction is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. You are correct. It is not, but it will make sense here in a couple of minutes. So satisfaction, the actual definition of it is fulfillment of one's wishes, expectations, or needs. Um, so fun fact, we will not have slides today, so you guys can just take the day off. Okay. Fulfillment of one's wishes, expectations, or needs. So basically, if you are satisfied, then you are completely fulfilled with your desire. There's, there's, you're, you're filled. There's a key word in there. There's no room left. That's what satisfaction does. It just eliminates everything else and brings you the desire that you were hoping for. So now, speaking of satisfied, being satisfied or satisfaction, there's a true story. Um, Superman challenged the Flash to a race, right? And the Flash was like, Superman, are you serious? Are you sure you want to do this? And Superman's like, absolutely, let's go. So they agree. They line up on the east coast of the U.S., and they're going to run all the way across the country to the west coast. So they line up. Boom, they go, they're running, Superman is running as fast as he can, and he gets all the way over to the west coast, and he realizes that the Flash is already there, sitting in a lounge chair on a California beach sunbathing. Superman gets mad. This is not right, I'm Superman, I should be able to beat him. So he says, you know what, I want a rematch. And the Flash says, are you sure? You sure you want to do that? He said, yes, tomorrow I want a rematch. So Next day comes, and they line up again on the East Coast. Boom, they take off, and Superman runs even faster this time. And, and he's like, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him. He gets over there and not only finds the Flash already sitting on the beach sunbathing, he's like eating an ice cream at that point. Now Superman is just livid at this point. And so he's like, Flash, I, I, want, I want one more shot. And Flash is like, I, I mean, I don't want to embarrass you again, but... Okay, I'll give you one more shot. So the next day comes, and they line up again, and somehow Superman snuck a pebble into the Flash's shoe. He's like, I'm, I'm going to win this time no matter what. So they line up, boom, they take off, and Superman's running even faster this time, right? And he's just going as fast as he can. Well, he finally gets over to the West Coast, and right as he gets there, he realizes that the Flash just gets there right before him. But Flash is kind of panting. He's actually broken a sweat a little bit, and Superman, not fully satisfied, but I mean, at least he got there. Um, he was like, man, I almost beat you. I almost beat you that time, and Flash says, you're right. You almost beat me, but... Man, somehow I got a pebble in my shoe, so I had to stop at the shoe store on the way here and get a new pair of shoes because I got a hole, and then I ma finally made it here. Okay, I know. Uh. <clears throat> he wasn't satisfied. Hopefully that's enough time for you guys to find Galatians chapter 5. Here we go. As we've been reading through our passage, Galatians 5 verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, 
so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, such a good word right there, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things... There is no law. <clears throat> Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. <clears throat> so we've been saying all along in this series, we have a key statement. And our key statement is always the one big thing that we need to remember. And our key statement for this series is true followers of Jesus. That's anybody who identifies as a Christian. If you say you're saved, if you say I'm going to heaven, if you call yourself a disciple, whatever, however you call yourselves, true followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit, those things that we just read about, and sanctification. And sanctification is that process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. It's <clears throat> those two lists of things that we just read. It's lowering the amount of things in the first list, the bad list, and increasing in the amount of the second list, the fruit of the Spirit. That's sanctification. So two weeks ago when we last uh, visited these, uh, thankfully Pastor Tony preached last week. He did an amazing job. Uh, but two weeks ago we talked about love. And we said there are four things love is. Number one, love is a verb. Okay, love is something that you do, not something that you have. Love is action. And I'll prove it to you. What means more to you if I tell you that I love you or if I show you, I demonstrate that I love you? Of course, the second is going to mean so much more. So number one, love is a verb. Number two, love is a constant mindset. Love is something that we have to have in our heads all of the time. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, do everything in love. Absolutely everything, do it in love. Proverbs 3, 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. It's really hard to hate someone when you're loving them. It's really hard to wrong someone when you're absolutely, truly, biblically loving them. It's hard to lie to them when you're loving them, to cheat them when you're loving them. So love is a constant mindset. Number three, love is a sacrifice. John 15, 13, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Love is a sacrifice. And number four, love is a downgrade of yourself. It's, it's lowering ourselves on the totem pole, lowering ourselves as far as order of importance. And what do we do when we do that? We put ourselves at the bottom and that puts everyone else above us. John 13, 5, it says, after that, speaking of Jesus, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus downgraded himself to the lowest of levels to serve his disciples and to prove his love for them. So <clears throat> that was love. What's the next fruit in the list? Love, joy. Okay, so we're going to talk about joy today. And I am excited to talk about joy. See what I did there? You guys are tough today. Verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now, I, I wasn't 
planning on spending a whole week just to talk about this one word. I knew we needed to cover love. Love is the big one. Love is the banner to which all of the other fruit kind of fall under. And I was like, okay, well, I'll pick two or three or four a week and cruise through. Um, and especially after I looked up the definition of joy. So I was like, all right, let's start with the definition and see what it actually is. So I looked in the dictionary, actually, I Googled it, and it says joy, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Not helpful. I'm going, yeah, probably not going to spend an entire week talking about that. That's pretty simple. We all really understand what that is, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. But is that really all it is? Or could there be something more to this fruit of the Spirit? I mean, we've only got a handful of them. And as I started to think, I was like, you know what, let me look up what this word originally means. And I, I kind of made a commitment to myself recently. I said, you know what, I've been, I've been going to a lot of the Greek. I'm going to try maybe not to do that as much, although I, I think it's really helpful at times. And so I'm going to try not to bog them down with Greek. And then I looked up the Greek and we're going to do it again. But it just so much can be pulled out of this original meaning of this word. So the original word is kara, kara, C-H-A-R-A. It means just joy or delight. So, okay, so that definition really doesn't propel us through with a whole bunch of other meaning to go behind until I started digging down a little bit deeper and, and to see kind of what words are related to this, where it comes from. And what I found out was there's, there's three other, there's three Greek words that kind of intertwine and have this root and kind of work together with each, with each other. So the first one is charis. Charis, that means grace or kindness. So we said kara is joy. So we have charis, grace or kindness. We have Cairo, <clears throat> and that means rejoice because of grace. And then we have our word kara. Now, again, not necessarily the full definition, but it really means joy because of grace. And so now you see, okay, maybe this is starting to take a little bit more form and a little bit more meaning that this joy that Paul calls us to have, it's joy, not just the feeling of being happy or fulfilled or satisfied, but maybe there's even something more that we can have this joy inside of us because of grace. And I tell you what, that is some good stuff right there. Grace? Anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, but anybody else need grace in this life? Uh-huh. Yeah, we need like a triple dose of grace, and that's like every minute renewed, right? So, kara, joy because of grace. There's this direct relationship between joy and grace. Now, question <clears throat> who is responsible for or in charge of grace? Who? Are we in charge of grace or responsible for grace? No. Who's in charge of it? God. Grace, grace. Oh, I see all the old school people in here. Yes. Okay. God's grace, right? <clears throat> Here's another question. And kind of here's where I'm going with this. Is grace dependent on our circumstances? Yes or no? No. And guess what? That's really good news. Because we mess up, don't we? We mess up constantly. And if grace was dependent on our circumstances, we would be in trouble, wouldn't we, church? So this kara, joy because of grace, is never dependent upon our circumstances, spiritual performance, or life events. That's really, really good news. That no matter what we do, no matter how much we mess up, no matter what gets thrown our way, no matter what, we can still have this kara, this joy 
that isn't dependent on circumstances. Now, what is the English word that is associated with uh, positive emotional feelings that are related to circumstances? What's that word that we use? Pharrell Williams sang a song about it. Happy, right? That word happy. But what's the difference between happiness and joy? What's the difference? Can you buy happy? Yeah. I mean, you can pay some money for some stuff and it can make you happy, right? Can you buy joy? No, I don't think so. So there's this big difference. Happy, again, is an emotion caused by circumstances. So the, the word happy, <clears throat> it sounds a lot like happen, doesn't it? And happen is a circumstance or even happenstance. It's a circumstance. It's a, a unit of almost of time, a measured time. It's something that happens at a point in time. So that's happy. It's temporary. It's circumstantial. But joy is not. It's not circumstantial. Here's, here's my definition of joy. I, I, I thought about this for a while. My definition of joy or kara is constant satisfaction and contentment. Now, th just already we've started off with a few really big words. We have constant, so that's all the time. Satisfaction, there's our word from our title. And contentment. Man, those are two really good things to have. Constant satisfaction and contentment that doesn't fluctuate due to circumstances because its foundation is found in God's unwavering and unending grace. I'll read it one more time. I know it's not on the screen. Kara is constant satisfaction and contentment that doesn't fluctuate due to circumstances because its foundation is found in God's unwavering and unending grace. So, <clears throat> I'll ask you this. If we closed out service, and I set up a table in the lobby, and I was selling Kara or Joy, who would be my customer? Everybody, right? especially if I was selling it really cheap. Every single one of us in here would want to buy as much as we possibly could. Who doesn't want that? Constant satisfaction and contentment. It never goes away. It never changes due to circumstances because of God's amazing grace. That's some good stuff. Where can I find this joy? Well, Joy, kara, is related to our salvation. That's where it comes from. Our salvation, in our salvation, we can find joy, true joy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Peter says this, speaking of Jesus, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him which I would say as followers of Jesus, as Christians, that would be us, right? We have not seen Jesus, but we say that we love Jesus, okay? And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, okay? Everybody's still tracking along. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, <clears throat> because of this relationship, this saving grace that we have in Jesus Christ, we love him and we are filled with this inexpressible and glorious joy. But the passage doesn't end there. We could ask the question, why? Why are you filled with so much joy that it's inexpressible? Like, like this verse, this passage here is saying, 
You can have so much joy that you can't even express it. You can't explain it. You can't sit down and write it out. Like there's so much joy inside of you that it's just like, like I don't even know what to say about it. Like I can't, I can't control it. It just happens in the midst of fill in the blank. I just have this joy. Why? Why can we have so much joy? Verse 9, 1 Peter 1, 9, it says, For, big word, remember, we're always looking for words like this in Scripture. It's a conjunction, con, with. It joins two things together. He says one thing, he says, For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How can we have so much inexpressible joy? Because we know what we have in Jesus Christ. That's it. Again, you can buy happy. You can have some things happen in your life that are good. But joy strictly comes from our salvation no matter what. Joy says, no matter what my circumstances look like, My future is full of joy because my eternity is secure with Jesus. That's what joy says. You guys like stories? You want to hear a story? All right. Story time with Pastor T. Here we go. Once upon a time. It's a true story, by the way. Actually, it is a true story. Once upon a time... There was a holy God. True so far? Okay. (laughs) If I lost you there already, we'll talk after service right up here. Okay. Just kidding. Once upon a time, there was a holy God. He says that there's an eternity with him in heaven. Good story, right? Good story so far. But, ah, ah, there had to be a plot twist, right, in our story. But... That eternity with him in heaven requires complete righteousness. Bad news. Bad news. Because guess what? You and I are incapable of complete righteousness. We can't do it. Now, another theological debate for another day. Do we obtain the righteousness of Christ through his... Yes, okay? That's salvation But on our own, we are incapable of complete righteousness. So we have, there's a holy God. He says there's eternity with him in heaven, but that eternity with him in heaven requires complete righteousness. So bad news, okay? Not only are we incapable of righteousness on our own, but watch this, more bad news, but we often choose to satisfy our flesh and sin against the holy God. So, yes, I get it. We're born with the sin nature. We cannot obtain righteousness on our own. We're basically doomed from the get-go, right? I know, great story, okay? But just to add insult to injury, there have been just maybe once or twice or a thousand times in our lives that we have actually chosen to sin against the holy God like we knew what was right and we chose to do the wrong thing instead everybody still tracking with me everybody kind of feel themselves in this story already it's kind of the point here okay here we go therefore since we choose to satisfy our flesh sin against the holy God incapable of perfect and complete righteousness therefore We are sentenced to hell because of our sin. I'm really glad the story doesn't end there. Because sin is attached to us. We can't just get rid of our sin. And our sin cannot enter a perfect heaven with a perfect God. So there is only one place left for our sin, and again, we are attached to our sin. You see what I'm saying here? Okay? Bad news. Ready for the next twist? But God. 
but God. Two of the most important words found in all of Scripture, but God. Here we go. Here's where the story gets really good. But God chose to send his one and only son, Jesus, to be crucified for us. Good news. So good news. And by choosing to place our faith in him, and give him control of our lives, meaning, okay, yes, Jesus came, died, rose again, conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, all of that to give us a way to obtain salvation. Not, oh yeah, I know Jesus, I believe in that stuff, but I'm going to still live my life according to how I live. It, it, It doesn't really work like that. It's, oh yeah, I have Jesus as a, a lucky rabbit's foot or fire insurance, No. It is a conscious choice. Jesus, I give you my life. Well, let's see. You gave everything for me. I'm going to give everything to you. Do we still mess up? Do we still sin? Do we? Absolutely, yes. But remember, true followers of Jesus, you will see fruit sanctification. So we choose to give our lives to Christ understanding what he did on that cross for us. And by choosing to place our faith in him and give him control of our lives, we can escape eternal damnation and spend eternity with him in paradise. The end. Good story, huh? That's a great story. That's the best story ever. But I want us to take the 30,000 foot view And think about that story. Holy God, we sinned against him and doomed ourselves. And he didn't have to, but he made a way for us to spend eternity with him. That's really good news. That's the gospel, which just simply means good news. That's the story I want us to understand. Now, question Do you think that's a good enough reason for you to have joy? I would think so. I mean, can you give me a better story? I'll wait. We'd be here a long time, and I'm hungry. You can't. You cannot give me a better story than that. That is a great reason to have joy. So, one more question. Knowing this, is there really anything that can happen in this life to take away that joy? Yes or no? No, there's not. I mean, bad stuff happens a lot, right? We can lose our job, that's bad. Um, Our dog could die, that's bad. I've got two dogs, they're jerks, but I love them, okay? Um, Some people love their dogs, okay? Some people love cats, we're praying for those people. Um, On a little more serious note, maybe there's a recent diagnosis that's bad. Maybe there's a relational issue that seems like it'll never be fixed. There's a lot of bad stuff that happens in this life. I get that. And I don't want to downplay any of that because that is real world, real time stuff that's happening to us and it hurts. Happy in those circumstances? No way. But is it possible to still have joy in those circumstances? Absolutely. We can have joy in the midst of everything. Um, <clears throat> remember the song, I don't know when it came out, it was late 80s, early 90s by Sinead O'Connor, Nothing Compares to You. Remember that song? I guess if we're on the theme of song titles to preach, I don't know where that came from, but she sang this song, Nothing Compares to You. 
And obviously it wasn't necessarily about God, but I was thinking about that going, you know what, God? Nothing compares to you. Nothing. No high, no low, no nothing. God, you are amazing. You are sovereign. You are awesome. But before Sinead O'Connor said it a handful of years ago, Paul said it. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says this. He says, I consider that our present sufferings. So what he's saying is, whatever's happening to your life. Remember, back then they were being persecuted, beaten. like, And Paul knew a little bit about hard times. Okay? Probably, and again, I don't mean to take away anything that you're going through, but probably... Ten times more, at least, of anything that we know. And Paul is able to say, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing. Such good words. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul's like, you know what? I know it's hard. I I can give you stories too. We could sit around and talk about stories all day long. But nothing compares to what God has for us. The glory of God that will be revealed in us, nothing compares to it. There is no comparison whatsoever. Have you ever heard anybody say, uh, the, the enemy or the devil or my circumstances or, or whatever, fill in the blank, stole my joy. They just, they stole my joy. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've, I've heard people say it a lot. Newsflash. No one or no thing can steal your joy. Can they? In light of what we have learned today, Nothing can steal your joy. But watch this. This is huge. You can give away your joy. That joy that you have from your salvation, you can take your eyes off of that prize and focus it on your circumstances. And, and I'm not saying, again, that our circumstances are, are not big, they're not an issue, they're not difficult. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you can have joy in the midst of whatever you are going through. Now, <clears throat> that's the end of my notes. And Friday afternoon, I was sitting in my office, and I was just about to wrap up And I had gotten a text message about 20 minutes earlier from the husband of the lady buying this this building. And they're writing a lease for us so we would be able to have a lease back and everything. So we were waiting to get that. Uh, Wednesday, Tony and I went to the attorney's office, signed closing documents. It was preliminary. They had to be sent to them. So closing is supposed to be tomorrow. So... I I get this text message, hey, what's your email address? I'm like, yes, all right, cool. They're going to finally email us the lease so we can look it over, approve it, sign it. Here comes Monday. And so I'm working on my notes. I get to this point, and my phone goes off with a notification. And I'm like, oh, it's an email. And I look, and sure enough, it's from them. And I look at the title, and it says, Sadly, not moving forward. And I, I thought, Lord, you have the weirdest timing ever <laughs> that something that we have been working on for over three years, something that we have spent a ton of time and money on, something that we got our plans for the new sanctuary and have paid a deposit to the builder and have just charged ahead. You guys know we moved from this building over to the North Campus. All of these things in place to close tomorrow. And the sale fell through. 
And I'm going, okay, God, you're really calling me to practice what I preach, aren't you? And as difficult as it was, it's very, very difficult. And I, I know the sale of a building pales in comparison to some of the things you guys are going through. There will be another buyer. There will be, hey, whatever, small potatoes. But it's just a real-time example. Hey, you know what? Oh, well, my God is sovereign no matter what. My God is good no matter what. My God will get us through this no matter what. And I can't promise that there's going to be another buyer tomorrow. I can't promise that we're going to get more money for this place. I can't promise any of that. But I do know, and I don't think the timing was just coincidence, I, don't, I do know that my God is good and that my joy, please, that we can have joy in anything, in anything. And guess what, church? That's really good news because this world, this life, the enemy, it's going to throw some junk at us, isn't it? No matter what, in the midst of all of that, we can still find this joy that's not based on our circumstances. So we'll move on. We'll figure it out. Hey, if anybody's got an extra two and a half million dollars laying around, I'll be in the lobby afterwards. That's fine, okay? Just want to throw that out there just in case. Kidding. I'm going to read my definition one more time. Kara. Constant satisfaction and contentment that doesn't fluctuate due to circumstances because its foundation is found in God's unwavering and unending grace. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for your grace, first off. It's where it all starts. Thank you that while we were still sinners, you died for us. And God, no matter what this life throws at us, we can still have joy. Thank you for that fruit of the Spirit that you want to produce in us. God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you. God, help us to not be distracted by the junk of this world. Not by the sin, not by the temptation. And God, help us to not be distracted by the events and the circumstances around us. Yes, God, they hurt and they're painful and they're difficult. And yes, you gave us those emotions. But God, through it all, we know that we can have joy. We know that our joy is not found in this world, but our joy is found in eternity with you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If there's any here this morning that do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that you have never experienced that grace or that joy that God has to offer, I want to give you that opportunity right now. If that's you, if you are just unsure about your salvation, unsure about your relationship with Jesus, right now in this moment, just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God, I trust that you sent Jesus to be hung on a cross for me. And that he rose again three days later, proving 
his authority over sin, over death, and the grave. And I put my full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Is there anybody that said that this morning for the first time? I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out or cause any attention, but I'd just love to celebrate with you and pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today for the first time? Thank you. Anyone else? Today is the day to start my relationship and my life with Jesus. God, thank you for your assurance. God, thank you that no matter what comes along in this life, we know that you didn't abandon us, that you are walking right alongside of us and oftentimes carrying us through. So God, help us to trust you in the midst of all of that. Thank you that we can have joy. Thank you for giving us that gift. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be generous. Help us to love others in such a way that they see you. Thank you for blessing us, God, so that we can bless others. And it is in the amazing, grace-filled name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.